All right, can everybody hear me good? The sound was a little quiet, but I think it's good now. So just real quick, I'm Ben. I'm the outreach coordinator for the Cornell Astronomical Society, who's hosting this lecture. Um, but this isn't about me, so let me uh, get with my introduction here. So um, it's, my, uh, on, it's an honor to introduce uh, Dr. Phil Nicholson as our lecturer for tonight. Um, he is uh, Australian, and he's been a, a professor at Cornell since 1982. Um, he has a PhD in planetary sciences from Caltech, and he spe specializes, my bad, in planetary rings. Um, he's also fond of history, and this is a very old conversation starter. He's an asteroid, um, 72020, sorry, 7220, Phil Nicholson, one word, named after him, which I think is pretty neat. <laughs> um, he's also a dear friend of our club. He's been our advisor for 40 continuous years. And so without his support, of course, CAST would not be what it is today. Um, you might also remember him as our keynote speaker from our, our telescope's uh, centennial celebration in October 2022. Um, so needless to say, Phil is deeply involved with CAST. He is a great friend of ours. He is a longtime supporter of our club. And it is a pleasure and an honor to have him here as a lecturer today. And we're deeply grateful for everything he does for us. So without further ado, thank you all for being here. And I'll hand the mic off to Phil. Thank you very much, Ben. Is it really 40 years? My goodness. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Time flies. Well, the telescope is older, at least, than I am. So, um, OK. So I guess it's obvious why we're talking about eclipses today, since we have one coming up pretty soon. Um, I'm not an expert on eclipses, at least not on observing eclipses. So in fact, if I manage to see this one, this will be the first total eclipse that I will have seen myself. I saw the annular one here in 1994 in space sciences, but I have not been lucky enough to see a total one yet. So I'm going to tell you more about the, the sort of basic geometry of what goes on in an eclipse. Most of you are astronomers, so you probably already know, know this, but I put some slides in for those people that might be guests or don't. Um, talk something about the cycles that underlie the eclipses, the so-called Saros cycles sort of gets a little bit more into dynamics and mathematics, which is my particular thing. Uh, and then if we still have time at the end, uh, I'll talk a little bit about something that seems a little bit disconnected, which is the history of the Earth-Moon system. But of course, it's the moon that makes the eclipses. And it turns out that observing eclipses is one of the ways we learn about the uh, distant history of the Earth-Moon system. Pretty much a good, good way to finish up. So uh, let's start with the very basics. There are lunar eclipses and there are solar eclipses. And they're connected to one another, but they're different. So a lunar eclipse happens at full moon. And you have the sun over here, the Earth in the middle, and the moon on the opposite side. So moon is being fully illuminated. And then at the moon, this is a view looking down on the moon's orbit rather than sideways on. So imagine it's looking down from the north pole of the moon's orbit. And as the moon moves around in its orbit, if it moves into the shadow of the Earth, uh, then the moon appears to disappear, turns almost invisible, and that's a lunar eclipse. There's an umbral period, which is where, if you were standing on the moon here, no point on the sun would be visible. So the moon is completely unilluminated, except it's a little illuminated from reflected light from the Earth. So you get some light from the backside of the Earth or refracted through the atmosphere. So you normally can see the moon, but it's much, much fainter than normal, and it has a sort of a coppery brown color. The penumbra is a region, if you imagined if you were the moon sitting here, you'd be able to see part of the surface of the sun, but part of it would be blocked by the Earth. So this is a partial shadow. So what you see is that the moon is gradually reappearing. So that's the basic geometry. And remember, this happens at full moons. And here's just a, basically an artist's sketch of what it would look, at, look like from the Earth looking out at the moon. So the dotted line here indicates the size of the umbra. That's more or less the diameter of the Earth. It's a little bit smaller. It's actually the diameter of the Earth's shadow at, at the distance of the moon. And then around that is the penumbra. And this thing shows the moon's path schematically moving across. And it gets a little bit darker when it's in the penumbra, but it's not so obvious. But then when it gets behind the umbra, it really gets dark. When it's going through this, you can actually see a bite taken out of the moon as it moves behind the shadow. So it's rather elegant to watch. In this particular case, the moon spent about an hour in the umbra before it came out of the 
So the lunar eclipses are, rel there are two things about them compared to solar eclipses. They're relatively slow. You have plenty of time to watch them. They, one like this lasts for an hour or more. The other thing is that it doesn't matter where you are on the Earth. You just need to be on the night side of the Earth so that the moon is up in the sky. And so anybody on that half of the Earth can see this. Both of those are different than solar eclipses, which happen quickly, and you have to be in a pretty narrow zone to see them. So that'll be an important feature. That's why they're, of course, much rarer to observe at any given spot. Okay, so a solar eclipse happens at new moon, when the moon is in the same direction as the sun. So now you have the sun over here, the Earth here. Instead of the moon being over here like it was before, it's over here, between the Earth and the sun. So it's at new moon. And what's happening is that now the moon is casting a shadow on the Earth. But the moon is much smaller than the Earth. So while the Earth's shadow is quite a bit bigger than the moon, the moon's shadow is much smaller than the Earth. And in fact, it turns out that the angular size of the moon, as seen from the Earth, is almost the same as the angular size of the sun. So the moon is actually just big enough to cover up the sun, but not by very much more. So it turns out that the we again use the terminology of umbra for if you're completely in the shadow of the moon, you can umbra outside. But unlike the lunar case, the umbra is quite a tiny spot at any given time. It's typically quite small, but it, it's no bigger than a couple of hundred kilometers in diameter on the Earth. So you have to be within that spot if you're going to see the moon, the sun eclipsed at that time. There's a much wider zone, which is the penumbra, where if you're standing on the Earth, you would see part of the sun by the moon, but what we really want to be doing is right here, because this is where the sun disappears, and this is where most of the interesting phenomena happen. So in here, you have to be in this spot to see a total solar eclipse. And it's just a note here to remind us, this diagram is not to scale. The sun is way off the left side of this plot, sort of hidden from the diagram. If it was going to scale, as we said, the distance of the moon from the Earth would be about 30 Earth diameters. would be 400 times shorter than that. So this is very much not the scale that it shows you. Let's get the uh, picture of what I started with. Could you please uh, put up the screen if you have a question? I'd rather have people ask questions as we go through rather than just try to stay to the facts of the article. I'm perfectly fine with these slides just being in context if you need it all. And uh, yeah, that's the screen. So I might not see your hands. on here, sure. So these are actual real pictures. You'll see because they're a little bit jerky, so it's not a cartoon. So this is a, a movie of the moon blocking the sun during a total solar eclipse from the Goddard Space Flight Center site. You see the solar corona that momentarily appears while the sun itself is, is blocked by the moon. You see it has a nice sharp edge because the moon has no atmosphere to blur the edge. The sun, on the other hand, has a somewhat blurry edge because it has a finite thickness atmosphere. It's also, a matter, it's also overexposed in this particular film, I think. So. OK? Let's see. Oh, keeps going. Is that good? I'll do it one more time. Take a close look at what happens. Just as the sun is completely blocked by the moon, you'll see bright spots around the limb. That's the sunlight shining through uh, mountains and valleys. On the, th the surface of the moon is not completely nice circle. It has little irregularities on it. And the other thing was that you could see the corona when the sun is when the when the moon is sun is completely blocked. So uh, if we don't actually happen to be somewhere where the umbra goes over us standing on the Earth, if we're a little bit off to the side, uh, so that we're not in that total region in here, then you see something like this. So here's just a series of stills showing a partial eclipse. So in this case, the, uh, the maximum blockage was about 2 thirds or so as the moon was moving across. And it starts. And then ends again. The whole period is about um, four hours for this. So like a lunar eclipse, 
the entire period of a solar eclipse, including the time when the sun is partially blocked, is again a couple of hours. It depends on the particular geometry of the event, but two to four hours is typical. But if you're lucky enough to be in the spot where the sun completely disappears, that is at the most about seven minutes, is about the maximum length for a solar, total solar eclipse. Most of the time it's less than that, it's more like two, three, four minutes. Okay, so this slide makes the point that I sort of said in words before, and that is that the reason for this curiosity is that coincidentally, the sun in linear distance and a sort of a natural or coincidental thing that these distances 
get the screen back. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to make it. Okay. okay. Uh, well, if I ask you what the period in the moon's orbit is, what would be your answer normally? Somebody on the street asks you, what is the period of the moon's orbit? 28. Hmm? 28, somewhere around there, 28, 29. That's the length of the month, right? That's where the month comes from. But there's actually several ways you can measure it. One is how long does it take to go around the Earth relative to the star? So if you kept track of where the moon was relative to Spica or some other nice bright star in the ecliptic, and then you waited for it to come back around to the same spot. I have my students do this sometimes. Then you find that it's about roughly only 27.3 days, which seems a bit short. On the other hand, if I keep track of the period between full moons, which is another easy thing to do, it's 29.5 days. It's two days longer. And that's because the Earth has moved around the Sun by an appreciable amount, about 30 degrees in that three months. So the Moon has to go a little bit further to catch up and be exactly opposite the Sun. Okay? But, turns out there's two other periods that are important too. And one of them, for the eclipses, is how, how often does the Moon cross the plane of the ecliptic? In other words, how often does the Moon cross that nodal magic we get the node there? And because the node itself moves a little bit, that's a little different than the so-called sidereal period, the period open to the star. It's about a couple of hours long, but it's about 27.5 days. The other thing that you've noticed if you care about total versus annual eclipses, you care about is the moon close to perigee or is it close to apogee? So the long axis, the so-called epsidal line of the moon's orbit, also slowly rotates in space. So the time it takes the moon to go from one perigee to the next perigee when you get total eclipses best uh, is the so-called, I'm sorry, I told you the wrong one. This is the one from the node, 27.2. This one is the one for the perigee. It's 27.5. So one is a little shorter than the sidereal period, the other is a little bit longer. So it turns out all of these periods uh, factor into the geometry of why, when eclipses are seen and whether they're total or annular, this kind of thing. That's what makes things interesting. It's complicated, as I said, by the fact that the moon doesn't have a circular orbit, it's eccentric by about 5%. We've already mentioned the fact that it's inclined relative to the ecliptic by five degrees, so we just get these two seasons each year in the eclipses. The important thing is this period connected to the nodes, the, the, the thing that's a bit hard to visualize, but it's important. And the nodes rotate about 18.6 years. It takes about 18 years for those line of nodes to move around the ecliptic completely. So not surprisingly, although it's not so easy to prove, this leads to a kind of an 18 year periodicity, and it's on that time scale that the eclipse patterns begin to repeat, and you begin to see some pattern. Because by then the nodes have moved all around the sky once and come back to where they were 18 years ago. Uh, okay, so I believe this too much. Whoops. Click on it again. You moved my cursor somewhere, perhaps. Oops. I need to have Chris on the screen. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Okay, so the cycle that we're talking about that governs this repeating is known nowadays as the Saros cycle, which it actually is, goes back to an ancient Babylonian or Mesopotamian term. Well, what I learned reading my stand telescope is that the name actually wasn't introduced until the 17th century. It was actually Edmund Halley, the English astronomer, who picked this name from antiquity and said this is an appropriate name. Apparently there wasn't a, a name, but nevertheless the cycle itself was well known. You see lots of references to the 18-year cycle in cuneiform tablets left by the Babylonians and by writings left by the Greeks afterwards. So it turns out the magic Saros period, which is a little over 18 years, um, actually, So it's 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours. What that period is, it's exactly 223 lunar months, where that's the interval between full moon to full moon, because obviously you need to be a full moon or a new moon to get an eclipse, so that's important. Uh, it also, 
It's just a little bit less than 242 of these so-called draconic months, the time it takes the moon to go from the node back to the node again, right? So those are important. And it turns out it's also almost, this is just chance, almost 239 of the anomalistic months, the time it takes to go from perigee to perigee. So after this um, roughly 18 year period or 6,585.3 days, give or take a little bit, then you get back to the same phase of the moon. So if you started out at a full moon, you get back to a full moon, right? So there's a possibility of a lunar eclipse. Uh, the moon gets back to the same position relative to the node. So its vertical position relative to the ecliptic is the same. So it either will or will not produce an eclipse, and that also determines the latitude on the Earth where the eclipse track goes for a solar eclipse. And you're also, because you're close to a multiple of these anomalistic months relative to the perigee, the moon is also about the same distance from the Earth. So you have the same geometry for total versus annual eclipses. So you get a very similar kind of eclipse at a similar place on the Earth after 18 years. And the only fact, is that it's not exactly 18 years, it's 11 days longer. So that means that next matching eclipse is going to happen 18 years later, but about 11 days later on the calendar. So similar eclipses, you look back 18 years, and then you'll find that they occurred 10 or 11 or 12 days, depending on leap years, before the one this year, right? So this one is April 8th. If you go back 18 years, you'll find one happening on about March 28th or 29th, whatever is 18 years before. 2006, I guess. The other thing is this 7.7 .7 hours. So what is that going to do? So I said so far we don't care about the orientation of the Earth. This is all to do with the moon's orbit. But if we care about, what will this affect? <coughs> so if we come back and we have exactly the same geometry again as far as the moon is concerned, but it's an extra third of a day. So in that time, the Earth has Rotated, right? By how much? How much does the Earth rotate in eight hours? One third, right, of the day, so it's about 120 degrees. So the Earth will be about 120 degrees different, or actually about 160 if you do it carefully. So that means that the, the eclipse may be similar, but the location, the track where it's seen on the Earth will be 120 degrees actually further to the west in longitude. The Earth will have rotated a bit more, so the sun will have got around further to the west. Okay. So, so every one of these 18 year periods, you get another almost but not quite a carbon copy of the previous eclipse. And this works for solar eclipses, and separately it works for lunar eclipses, because they're all controlled by the same geometry. So there's a Saros series for solar eclipses and a Saros series for lunar eclipses. What makes life complicated is that those are not the only, there's multiple sorrow cycles all going on at the same time that are interleaved with one another. And that's what makes the pattern look kind of random. And in fact, at any given time, at the moment, for example, which is typical enough, there are 40 of these solar sorrow cycles at work, all going on simultaneously. And there are 42 lunar sorrow cycles. So the number of cycles, number of eclipses per year, now, each one of these, any particular Saros cycle, is only going to produce one such eclipse every 18 years. They would be really rare if there was just one such cycle. But since there are 40 solar ones and 42 lunar ones, you have that many cycles going on. Each of them produces one every 18 years. So you divide this and you get about 4.6. And that's, rough. that's where the four or five eclipses of some kind or another happen. Any one of these Saros cycles doesn't last forever. It gives you about 70 eclipses before it doesn't work anymore. And that's about 1,300 years. And the reason for that is that these periods are not exactly the same. There's differences of a couple of hundreds of a day between them. So the, the, the anomalistic and the draconic periods are not quite multiples of the uh, lunar month. If they were, then the thing would repeat exactly like clockwork. And that was the initial assumption. But if you look over a long enough period, you see that they gradually gets out of phase. Okay, so you all understand this, right? This is the tricky part. Okay, so here's a nice diagram. This is one Saros cycle, and it's a set of nine eclipses out of a, nine solar eclipses, 
Um, the Saros cycles are some, somewhat arbitrarily numbered. Somebody made a catalog of all the eclipses over about a 5,000 year period back in the 19th century, and they were just used somewhat arbitrarily to number them. So this is Saros uh, number 136. And uh, this shows the eclipse class between 1937 and 2081, so over about 150 years, so there's nine of them all together. These are all solar eclipses, and this shows just a picture of the Earth, and it shows the track for the total solar eclipse in each year. And you see two things here. One of them is that if you start with the earliest one here in 1937, right? The next one happened 18 years later in 1955, 120 degrees to the west, but very similar looking to this one. And then another 18 years, 1973, this one's over Africa, another 120 degrees to the west. But what happens when you go one more 18 year period? So each one is about a third of a day later. So after three of these, you come, Earth comes almost back to the same place. So if we start one, two, three, number four is over here. So it's back in the Western Hemisphere. It's about roughly the same longitude. That's because the 7.7 .7 days is almost a third of a day. And then that gets followed by this one, another 120 degrees later, and it gets followed by 2027, and then the next one comes back here to 2045, 2063, 2081. Okay, so they keep moving west, and every third one is back on essentially the same hemisphere as the one before, approximately. You can see that they're quite the same. There's a little offset here, but it's not exactly eight hours. The other thing you notice, which is trickier, is that the eclipse path, in this case, moves steadily north. Okay? Anybody guess why? We can tell why the east-west is not exactly 120 degrees, because the 7.7 .7 hours is off a little bit. What do you think determines where they appear, north-south? Think about the moon moving around on its orbit. <laughs> Not the tilt of the Earth, but this tilt here, the tilt of the moon's orbit. So he said that these are only going to happen if the new moon lines up close to the node, but as we heard over here, it's not going to be exactly on top of the node, right? It'll be a little off, but it has to be close. And because this nodal period of the moon is not quite a multiple, a fraction of the orbital period, now if the moon is below the node for one new moon, the next one it might be slightly above the node, and then it moves again. So if the moon is a little above or below the node, that means its shadow won't be pointed like this, right at the center of the Earth, it'll be pointed at some point up here in the northern hemisphere or pointed down in the southern hemisphere. And if it gets too far off, of course, you can miss the Earth completely. So because these periods are not exactly multiples of one another, the net result is that from one period to the next, and this is actually three times 18, so this is 54 years, it moves a little bit. And it turns out that if the nodes occur at the ascending node, if it flips the curve, the ascending node, then the tracks move downwards, and if it occurs at the descending node six months later, they move upwards, like in this picture. So this is nice pattern series. This is why there's only about 70 of these before they quit, because eventually the, the track moves off the top of the Earth, either down here. So it takes about 70 of these cycles, the three here, the track to move from here, from the south pole to the north pole. But by then, some other Saros cycle has started working. So on average, there's always about 40 of them. This is um, 25 years worth of total solar eclipses. And they look a bit different. But if you look carefully at this diagram, there are four examples of these two very similar ones that are in the same Saros, because 25 years is a bit longer than 18 years. So for example, if you look at the 20, 2002, in the 2020, they're almost the same, but they're just 120 degrees apart. These two in the Antarctic are pretty obvious because they're so unusual. 2003, 2021. So they're listed here. So there's four of them all together that are actually this one here. 2006, and here's our friend from next month, 2024. So the last similar one 
was this one in 2006 that went through North Africa. And if you look over longer periods, you see uh, the patterns become more obvious. So we uh, mentioned, well, the last total solar eclipse visible in North America actually wasn't too long ago. It was in uh, 2017. Uh, but this one was at the descending node, so the moon was going from north to south, basically, as across the ecliptic. You'll see the next one was the reverse of that. Uh, this shows the width of the track, it's typically about 200 kilometers wide. And the greatest duration was here over Missouri. So here we didn't get a very good chance in New York to see it, but we went down to South Carolina. So anybody see this one? Travel and, oh, a bunch of people. Where'd you go? I didn't have to go. It was at my high school in St. Louis. <laughs> oh, you were in St. Louis? <laughs> yep. Oh, so not that far. Right here. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Tennessee. Ah, yes. Good place. And in Tennessee, North Carolina border. Ithaca would be as a partial. Oh, yeah, so you would see it as a partial in Ithaca. But if you were in this little track between the two blue lines, you would see a total eclipse. Um, okay, so remember what that one looks like. So uh, I'll show you the coming one on the next slide. Uh, these are um, astronomers diagrams. They don't look as elegant as the previous one, but it sort of shows you the geometry. This compares the one, the annual eclipse that happened just last October. Okay? So the red line and red is the coding is that red was the moon was at the descending node, so it's moving from the north of the ecliptic to the south of the ecliptic. So the eclipse track tends to go from north to south on the Earth as well. This one coming up in April is at the ascending node. Six months later, you notice it's in April versus October, so it's, the Earth is on the other side of the orbit. So the moon is moving from below the ecliptic to above the ecliptic, so the track tends to go from south to north. Okay. They're both similar widths, a couple of hundred kilometers, and of course this one is going to go through New York. This one did not. Uh, but my brother lives in San Antonio, Texas, and he gets to see both of them, actually. He saw this one from his backyard, and he ought to be able to see this one from his backyard, too, so he's in the right spot. Um, there's one other curious thing about these eclipses I didn't mention. Most things that we observe on Earth, like the sunrise or the sunset, move from east to west, right? The sunrise happens first in the east, later in the west. That's why the time zones get later as you go across the country. Eclipses do the reverse. The track moves from west to east. On any of these, it doesn't matter whether it's the ascending or the descending node, the moon starts over here and ends up, over, the shadow starts over here and ends up here. So the reason for that is that the reason the sun rises earlier in the east and later in the west is because of the direction that the Earth rotates at, right? But in this case, the, the, the control is more determined by how fast the moon is moving in its orbit. That turns out to be faster than the Earth is rotating. So they're both moving in the same direction, but the moon is overtaking the Earth. So that's why the eclipse, the shadow of the moon, always tends to move from the west to the east. Because the Earth's rotation isn't enough to keep up with the moon. Can anybody tell me how fast an eclipse track does move? Or a rough idea? Few hours. Hmm? A few hours. Yes, but what the, you know what the speed is, roughly? Oh. <laughs> yes, it's about 3,000 kilometers per hour. That's a good number. About 2,400 miles an hour. Takes um, about an hour and a half to get it what, coast to coast across North America. So it's about the same speed as the current world speed record, which is set by an SR-71, one of these 2,000 mile an hour reconnaissance fighters. And that, that set a record to fly from an airbase in California to Washington I think, in about two hours. The Eclipse routinely does about the same speed as the fastest plane we have. So it's not really impractic practical to keep up with one. Okay, so the one we have coming up. Uh, so the totality of the place, it begins out in the Pacific Ocean. Go back to this one for just a second. So here's the same track I showed before. So the eclipse starts. This uh, elliptical thing represents sunrise. So obviously you can't see it before sunrise. So sunrise, the eclipse begins over here, comes onto the Earth, 
down in south of Hawaii, way south of Hawaii in the South Pacific, moves across the Pacific, crosses into North America in uh, Mexico near Mazatlan, moves up across Mexico to Texas in the middle of the U.S. up through New York, great maritime provinces out through Newfoundland out into the Atlantic, and eventually about halfway across the Atlantic, there's Iceland up there, it's uh, sunset. So this is sunrise to sunset across the earth. Okay? This is in uh, time, and these are in 30 minute intervals. So this is, this is brand time. 17 hours, 17, 30, 18. So this is 18 hours, this is 19, this is 19, 30. So it's a little more than an hour and a half. It's about an hour and three quarters to get from Mexico to Newfoundland. Uh, so the eclipse starts at around 1638 universal time, and Greenwich time ends at about 1955, so altogether it's a bit more than three hours. Uh, is in North America from 1807 to 1946, about an hour and a half, as I said. Animation is the ground speed in terms of that. The uh, New York is much smaller, it takes about nine minutes to cross New York from Buffalo to Plattsburgh, basically. 1517 to 1526. The width is about 200 kilometers. Um, given this speed and given this width, because that's the width of the track, but it's also roughly the diameter of the shadow of the sun, of the shadow of the moon on the Earth. So if you take that width and divide by the speed, you get the duration. And if you do the center line, you get the longest, because that's about four and a half minutes. And that happens down in Mexico is where it's longest. It's only about three and a half minutes up in New York because the geometry isn't uh, by chance, as I mentioned already, the two tracks crossed in southern Texas. So actually, uh, Kerrville, just west, northwest of San Antonio, is the optimum spot where you, or the two center lines cross one another. So these guys are planning a big festival coming up. Um, it, you can be anywhere in the 48, lower 48 states, and you'll see a partial eclipse. Um, but if you're at the corners, like up in Seattle, you only see about 20% of the sun blocked. If you're down in Miami, you see about 45% blocked and appropriate fractions in between. Uh, in Ithaca, we're pretty close. It's about 99%. And it will happen at uh, 323. 323. 323 in the afternoon is the midpoint. But as we all know, it's better not to be on the edge of it. It's better to be 100%. Uh, just part of the Total eclipse across North America, so here's my line down in Mexico. Here's uh, southern Texas. Looks like Dallas <coughs> is in the park up here. St. Louis just misses this particular time. Uh, but Cleveland is in the park, Indianapolis is in the park, so a couple of big cities. And then New York does pretty well. Buffalo is basically right on the center line, as is Rochester. Uh, Syracuse is a bit off. But it doesn't show it, it's kind of too small, but it turns out that Watertown and Plattsburgh are also basically right along the line. Before. It's up into Canada, and then eventually over Newfoundland and out to the oceans. So this is just a zoom in on that of the uh, northeastern part of the country. So the blue line is the central line where the eclipse is longest. Uh, you have to be between the two red lines to see the total eclipse. Outside of that, a little sliver of the sun will still remain visible, and it won't be nearly as spectacular. So it's worth driving from, say, here up to here. See the plot thing. But the next one shows some times on it, so it's a sort of slight zoom in on this plot. So here's just the, the New York plot, with our favorite little college town here. Uh, so we have the green line is the center line, these are the two edges. Toronto just misses. No luck, so all the Canadians probably will be down at Niagara Falls, or they may go to Kingston. Um, and these are the timings, so the top line that here represents the time of the, when the center point, sorry, the time of the beginning of the total eclipse. So this is from Erie, Pennsylvania, Buffalo, Rochester, um, Watertown, Plattsburgh, and the time underneath it is the duration of the eclipse. And it varies a bit depending on how close you are to the center line, plus it's getting gradually less as you go to the north. It's uh, about 3 hours 45 minutes in Buffalo, 322 in Watertown, about 3 and a half. 
And you can see here it's about 316 to 325, so it's about nine minutes as advertised from one end to the other. These are very unforgiving. If you don't set your alarm clock correctly and you miss it by 10 minutes, tough luck, it's all gone. And this is what I mentioned before. This was Kerrville. This was the uh, October uh, annual eclipse. This is the annual total solar eclipse, and Kerrville is right next to the But my brother's house is about here. He did get to see both. So by now you sort of understand the Saros cycle, so you ought to be able to predict what's going to happen in the future, right? So uh, we're in Saros series 139, that's the book this particular eclipse is a member of. It started in 1501, and it will go through to about 2763. There's 71 of them, and this is uh, number 30 in the sequence, so we're a little bit less than halfway through the cycle. The last one was 18 years ago, 29 March 2006, 18 plus 10 days. That was visible 120 degrees in the east of here. That was visible in North Africa and the Middle East. The next one will be another 18 years and 10 days on so the 20th of April 2042. This one will be visible another 120 degrees to the west, so rather than North America, the Japanese will get to see this one in the western mm -hmm. Pacific. Yep. This might not be applicable yet, but if we were to rename like a Sarah cycle, would it be, would it take the name of an old one? Like say like one is at the end of its like 70th cycle or something, would a, the newest one get one? Or I guess that might not. Happen. I think they didn't to avoid confusion. Okay. I'm not sure. I think they just took this 5,000 year calculation, which is the longest anybody has ever done. And they just went through and assigned numbers to all of them. And I don't think they reused the numbers because it would be there's plenty of numbers in the universe and it would just lead to confusion. I'm pretty sure of that. You can find some very complicated charts online if you look that show all of these cycles all together, but they're so horrible, I've looked at them and said, no, I don't even want to show that. It's... But hopefully you can see the basic pattern, here, right? So you see the 18 year pattern from one to the next. And all of these have similar geometry, except that they move progressively to the west. But the last one with a similar ground track to this one was three times 18 years back when we, the Earth was back in the same place. So that was 54 years earlier. So that was on the 7th of March, 1970, which was 54 years plus uh, three times 10, about 30 days. And that one back went through Mexico, the eastern US, and Atlantic Canada. So it's a very similar slice. Conversely, the next one is going to be 54 years in the future, plus 30 days. So that's about the 11th of May. 2078, and this one, these tracks are moving to the south, so this one will go through Mexico and the southeastern part of the U.S. So this series of ones is moved, is ascending node and it's moving southwards, moving from the North Pole to the South Pole, rather than the other example I showed you. And here's just the plot of them. It's a bit too small to see the numbers, but that's not the point. This is a, the, the nine eclipses in this series with the next one in the middle. So here's our one in April 2024. This was back in 1952, 1970, 1988, 2006, us, 2042, 2078. And I've arranged them in sets of three so that you can see every three eclipses in the cycle, you're back to a track in the same part of the world, in this case, the Western Hemisphere, whereas all of these ones are occurring somewhere in the Western Pacific, all of these ones are occurring over the Middle East or Africa. Plus, you can see the track is steadily moving. Uh, in this case, it's moving gradually to the south. It doesn't, actually, this one doesn't move too much. It, it does move slightly to the south. Notice that the angle on the Earth also changes. And that does depend on the equinoxes. That depends how close uh, we are to the equinoxes for the Earth. That has to do with the tilt of the Earth's axis. And if you're at the solstices rather than the equinoxes, the tilt is greater or less, so that's why that tilt varies. Okay, so we're five past. Can I finish the description of the background? So the rest part will just talk a little bit about some of the science that's done, but we, your choice as to whether we stop at this point or... Can you do a, a brief version? Yeah, this part is fairly brief, I think, okay. so. Okay, just a few slides on each. Um, so... Most of the time now, we look at eclipses because they're beautiful to look at, 
And those people that have actually seen one before can attest to this better, but the experience is apparently hard to describe and hard to compare with anything else. Sometimes it's described as the most spectacular natural phenomenon that you know, a human ever gets to observe on Earth. I'll find out whether that's true in a couple of weeks. Yeah. But in the past, they've served an important scientific purpose, especially in the old days, to make certain kinds of measurements. Um, the oldest one we know about, obviously the Babylonians use it for something, but uh, we don't know exactly what scientifically, but they were mostly interested in predicting them for religious reasons, because it was expected that eclipses, they were omens of something either good or usually something bad going on. So they were usually charged by their emperors with, you better not surprise me by having an eclipse when I'm not, not ready for it. So they had a job of predicting when these things would happen. Uh, but the Greeks actually started using it for science. So Aristarchus in about 250 BC actually used this to figure out the size of the moon and tried to figure out the relative uh, distance. And we'll save time and I won't go into details, but he made a diagram like this indicating the sun, the earth, the moon, and then he, he measured the size of the moon compared to the shadow. And you combine that with the half a degree angular size of the moon. And then you can easily show that at the distance to the moon, <coughs> the moon here, is just the radius of the earth divided by 3.5, which is the number of times the moon fits in the shadow, divided by the sine and half of this angle of half a degree. So it's very simple geometry. But if you plug the numbers in here, this tells you this is to the moon, is about 65 times the radius of the Earth. And that's very close. The current number, the mean number, is about 384,000 kilometers, or about 60.2 times the radius. So we came, got very close to the right answer. He also tried to use solar eclipses combined with lunar eclipses to, uh, to figure out the distance to the sun as well. And that he didn't do so well. It turned out that required more accurate measurements than he had available to him. So his number was that the sun was 19 times further away than the moon. I mentioned at the beginning, it's actually 400 times further away. But 19 times further away already said that the sun had to be 19 times bigger than the moon because he knew like we do that they're the same angular size. And since the earth was only about three and a half times the size of the moon, ergo, the sun is bigger than the earth, right? The sun is 19 moons, the earth is three and a half moons. So Aristarchus was one of the few Greek astronomers who concluded by sort of physical arguments that probably the sun is more important than the earth. Probably the earth orbits the sun rather than even though it appears to be. Unfortunately, his argument didn't convince most other Greek astronomers, so it, it remained a, a minority view. But he, he did that. Um, so the The next one was Hippocras, who was about uh, 400 years later, about 100 AD, looking at Alexandria. And he came up with the clever idea that if you wanted to measure an accurate orbit for the sun, the best way is to measure it relative to stars. But the trouble is, when the sun is up in the sky, you can't see any stars, right? Except during a solar eclipse, then suddenly the sky goes black. And if you can avoid, if you can tear your way, our eye away from looking at the moon and the sun and look at the stars, you can actually measure where the stars are relative to the sun. So you can figure out where the sun's in its, in its orbit. So this was a painstaking thing. He had to do several eclipses to do this. But he measured carefully the orbit of the sun. And one of the things that came out of that is that he measured the precession of the Earth's axis. He discovered that the axis of the Earth was slowly moving in space. It wasn't staying fixed relative to the plane of the Earth's orbit. That's a 26,000 year period, so it's quite a subtle measurement to make. But he did that in about 100 AD using his eclipses, but he also went back to Aristarchus and used eclipses that had been observed a couple of hundred years before to get along in our baseline. Ptolemy used that in his famous book on Greek astronomy, but that's where the number came from. Then jumping ahead to the present day, I already showed you pictures during the eclipse. You can see the red light of the chromosphere or the reversing layer, that region of the sun's atmosphere above the main part. So that part of the atmosphere was actually discovered by observing during eclipses and people realized that, okay, this must be an otherwise invisible part of the atmosphere. And in the early days, relatively speaking, 80 years ago, 1940s or so, 
when astronomers were starting to make quantitative models of stellar atmospheres and they were asking questions like how does the temperature vary with height in the atmosphere of a star and can we use that to explain the spectrum of light that we see from the star. So the sun was their test example that they tried to understand first. And looking at those pink emission lines from H alpha, high vision alpha, were the key to figuring out. And it's fact called the reversing layer, uh, partly because absorption lines turn into emission lines, but also because the temperature gradient changes. It's like the Earth's stratosphere. The temperature usually decreases with altitude in the visible part of the atmosphere, but above that it turns around and the temperature starts increasing again. And the Earth's stratosphere does the same. In fact, eventually it gets up to about a million degrees up in the corona. So that was the other important thing, was that the corona was first observed directly by taking photographs during the eclipse, and naturally you can see it with the naked eye. But they started studying it quantitatively by observing it during the eclipse, and that's when they discovered it was very high temperatures up in the corona. But probably the neatest thing from a modern point of view is this, the last two items here. So here's a same picture of the corona that I think I showed you before. So in 1919, there was a solar eclipse. And the significant thing about that day is that this was only three years after Einstein had published his general theory of relativity. This was not the special theory that said E equals MC squared. This is the one where he said, oh, I can understand gravity, not as some mysterious force that attracted things together, like, like uh, Newton basically said, but actually it's a, it's a distortion of space time. So you have to think in four dimensions to understand gravity properly. And it had lots of consequences, most of which were very tiny in the solar system and very hard to experimentally measure. So it was a nice theory, but there was no immediate way to test it. But one of the predictions it made that was testable was that the gravity of the sun was strong enough that it would actually bend light. If you had light traveling, not through it at the sun, but just by the edge of the sun, it would be bent. And the bending wasn't very much. In angular terms, it's only a couple of arc seconds near the edge of the sun, but that's a measurable thing with astronomy as of uh, the beginning of the 20th century. So they decided to do something very similar to what, Aris, uh, what Hipparchus had done. When, when can you measure the stars being bent? Well, obviously an eclipse is the right time. But now what you do is you take photographic plates of the sky when the sun is not there, and then you go out and you take photographic plates of that same part of the sky when the sun is there, and because it's eclipsed, you can actually see the stars in the background. So these are a couple of, two of the gentlemen that went out from Britain. So there were two expeditions. Um, one of them went to Sobral of Brazil, the others went to the island of Principe out in the Atlantic Ocean. So to cover the weather, I guess, they picked two different places to go. So this actually was a pretty small instrument. You don't need a giant telescope to see the sun. So this is two of them. The other guy involved became famous later as a theoretician. This is Sir Arthur Eddington. In later life, he was very famous as a theoretical astrophysicist, but early on, he was more of an observer. And he was one of the people who did this. And here he is, some years later, having a little chat with uh, Einstein over here. He came to visit, but this was many years later. This is just one of their diagrams showing where they predicted the stars to be the sea. So the bottom line is that they were able to measure this, and both groups independently, they reduced the data, and they were both able to see that the stars closest to the sun were measurably shifted on the sky, and as you got further away from the edge of the sun where the gravity was weaker, the shift was less and less. So it turned out, within the accuracy, it beautifully fitted Einstein's prediction. And there was no way this would happen under classical physics. This was just completely unexpected. So it was taken by most people as a very elegant proof of Einstein's theory. So let me show you the last thing then. I mentioned it has something to do with the history of the moon. And that is because one of the things the moon does is raise tides in the earth. And those tides dissipate energy in the oceans as you raise tides and that tidal bulge moves around the earth. The earth oceans are an imperfect system, they dissipate energy. That energy ultimately comes out of the rotation of the earth itself. And in fact, it takes angular momentum out of the earth's spin and moves it into the moon's orbit. So while it's slowing down the earth, actually it's uh, speeding up or actually expanding the moon's orbit. So because of the tides, these two things are happening all the time, but at a very slow rate. And we know now that the moon's orbit is expanding at the rate of about 3.7 meters per century. 
3.7 inch and a half per year. And we actually know this because the Apollo missions left laser retroreflectors on the surface of the moon and they still work. They're passive, we bounce laser beams off them from the Earth. So after 50 years, we have a lot of pretty good measurements. So we actually know that number quite well. Yeah. But it was known from some astronomical observations roughly back in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, so what that means, if you think about it, if you, if you go back and predict where a particular solar eclipse will be seen, a, it depends on the moon's orbit. So if the moon is moving away, its orbital period is getting a bit longer. So these periods were a little bit longer in the past. So the moon will have been in a not quite the same position relative to the sun as you think if you, don't, if you ignore this. But more importantly, the slowing down of the Earth means that the Earth's rotational position would have been different. So that means an eclipse that you predicted to happen in Europe maybe actually was seen in China or Japan or India. And it turns out that the rate shows that the length of the day, 24 hours, is increasing by 1.6 milliseconds, thousandth of a second, so 0 0.0016 seconds each century, which doesn't sound like much, but that's 16 seconds over a million years. But the important part is that this is changing the rotation rate of the Earth. So that's an acceleration of the Earth. So it builds up in terms of the angular displacement, it builds up quadratically, right? It says your clock is not only at the wrong speed, it was going faster and faster as you go back into the past, right? So there's a quadratic buildup. So the error, the error in the rotation period of where the Earth was, turns out to grow, you turn the rotation of the Earth into a difference in time for, say, a star being overhead. It's about 31 seconds per century squared, or over a thousand years, that's 10 centuries, <coughs> it's a square 10, and it's 3,000 seconds, getting to be about an hour. If you go back 3,000 years, which is kind of the length of historical data we have on eclipses, it's about nine times bigger than this. So you start talking about six or seven hours. In other words, the Earth is six or seven hours off from where you thought it to be. So this is a plot using that. So these are each of these vertical lines here, or an arrow, represents a measurement, a historical measurement of an ancient either solar eclipse, or in the heavy lines, and the thinner lines are lunar eclipses. So these indicate historical records, and they're certainly in pumps of time. These are basically mostly European records and Arab records going back to about 500 AD. And uh, these, some of these are Chinese as well, and these are the Babylonian records back here, back at around minus four or 500 in uniform tablets. And this is the era the, from when they reported the eclipse was observed, or the time they reported it. You can figure out, okay, roughly the, the clock, the rotation of the Earth was off by that much. <coughs> and now it's a few hundred seconds, but you go back to 500 BC and it's about 15,000 seconds. So here's the time in hours. So back there, it's four or five hours off. So in fact, if you uh, predict what this should be, based on how fast we observe the moon moving away from the Earth with the laser ranging, if we conserve angular momentum and say all of the angular momentum that the moon has gained, the Earth must have lost, then you predict that it should follow these dotted these lines, and this is kind of the uncertainty here. The actual best fit is this solid line here, and it's very close to the dashed line, which is just a parabola, it's just a quadratic line. So the, the beta are very close to the parabola, and they're very close, not the day, but they're within about uh, 15 or 20 percent of the expected number. But this is probably what's going on. So this is our best historical data on the rotation of the Earth over a long period and how fast the eclipses are really working. So this is one case in which these things are still serving a, a valuable historico-scientific uh, use. And if, some of, if only the ancient Babylonians had real clocks and they had timed these things more accurately, we would have been in much better shape, but they, they had water clocks and more similar sorts of things. So basically they timed things to the nearest hour or so typically rather than to the nearest nanosecond. But anyway, that's a good place to finish. So one, two. Just mention, leave this one out my summary. Um, it said the last total solar eclipse here, uh, actually anywhere from the continent of the US was the one in August 2017, but that's uncommonly recent. The next two that are in the catalog are in 20 years from now, <coughs> compare them in 2044 and 2045. 
Uh, one of them is an annual eclipse up in Montana and Alberta, mostly in Canada. And one in 2025 is a total one, which is rather like the one in 2017. But if you pick just Ithaca, it's much rarer. The last one that actually happened was in January 1925. And the next one, after the departure of a few years ago, is in 2144, so 200 years later. The amazing thing about this one, if you looked at the poster, whoops, that's just the ones in a couple of years, is we have a picture of it. And you should probably recognize this, right? Your tower, your library. You can tell me what building this is. It doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. This is Boardman Hall. Right? This is where Olin Library is now. Back in 1925. And we're standing basically looking across the arts court. And this was nine o'clock in the morning, so we're looking off uh, in the southeast. The moon, obviously, the Ithaca was not completely clear. The portrait was not clear, right at the right time. So this was done by a local photographer downtown who came up and did this probably as an advertising for his business. So, so I will leave these up here at the end. These are a couple of questions for you to puzzle about things that lead on. So. In that photo, what's like the screen? What is? What is like that screen? Like is this, is this photo taken? Which street? Oh, is this like a, is this like a, this like is snow. Photos? This is in Geo Water. Uh, this is snow, I think, on the outside. This was in February, January or something. I said it's cloudy. I said it's cloudy. So let me finish by asking you one of, the, one of the questions up here, which is, when won't there be any more total solar eclipses? And why? Why do I say there won't be any more at a certain point? Connected to what we were just talking about, the history of the moon's orbit. Right? Yeah. When it circles down far enough where it's like, I guess, like an exact point, essentially. And that, I also have a question about that. Is there any where it's like halfway between the total eclipse and the annual eclipse, uh, eclipse where it kind of is like a point almost right now? Has that happened? So that's close to where it is now on average. But the moon's orbit, remember, is eccentric. So any particular eclipse is never quite average. But yes, so in the future, the moon will be far enough away so that even when it's at perigee, it's not big enough on the sky to completely cover the moon, completely cover the sun, right? And beyond that, the moon will always be a little smaller than the sun. The distance to the sun doesn't really change, but the moon is moving away. So as it moves away, there'll come a point where even at perigee, when, even when the moon is at its largest size, this was supposed to oops, indicate, well, uh, so even when it's at a larger size, it won't quite be able to block the sun. So at that point, we'll still get annular eclipses, but we won't get total eclipses anymore. And conversely, in the past, if you wind the clock backwards, when the Earth moon was closer to the Earth, it would have been big enough that even at apogee, it would have been large enough to cover the sun completely. So you would never have had annular eclipses then. The moon would have been too big, they were either partial or total. So we're living in a kind of special period where we're switching over from total eclipses that were the standard. This turns out to be several hundred million years ago. This was the case. And a few hundred million years in the future, uh, the, the uh, total ones will disappear and they'll all be annular eclipses. And that leads to one of the other questions, which is what can you say about other planets and other satellites? And my guess is that there are there are no others that exactly match this in the same as the Earth and Moon do, but it's an, you can think of cases that are obvious total eclipses, like Io being occulted, occulting the Sun from Jupiter, that's gonna be a total eclipse. There are others like Phobos and maybe Iapetus at Mars and Saturn where the satellites are small enough that they probably only partially block the Sun. 
But I'll leave that as an exercise for somebody who likes spreadsheets. Okay, we should go and observe, right? I think there's snow outside. It's probably snowing. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Nicholson. Um, so we're going to just uh, check the Zoom for questions to make sure. And also, um, for anyone here who is not a Cornell Astronomical Society member, um, as a kind of uh, present from us to you, uh, we're going to give out eclipse glasses and some stickers. So please stick around for a few minutes so we can hand those out. And I'd also just like to reiterate the point that uh, Professor Nicholson made in the presentation, a very important point, that Ithaca will not be in totality. So if you want to go see in totality, go up to a city like Buffalo or Rochester or Syracuse. And if you're in Ithaca, this is important for the students here especially, um, make sure when you're looking at the sun, always keep your eclipse glasses on. There's no point in Ithaca that is safe to take off your eclipse glasses. You have to do that in totality. So thank you all, and we'll uh, just check Zoom real quick for questions. <laughs> And I'd also like to apologize to everyone on Zoom for the audio cutting out for a few minutes. Mm. <laughs> and thank you, Lucas, for being here. Can <laughs> you get it back? Can we get it back? Thank you. Thanks. Oh, just the other. Yeah. 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 Oh, there's one. thinks there's a question? It's just the audio. Uh, never mind. Yeah, it's just that. Uh, no questions? All right. All right. Goodbye, everybody thank on Zoom. Thank you, Lucas, Lauren. Thanks for hanging in there. Bye-bye. Oh, there you go. Oh,